this running. There is running over there, and there's the ports. So now I'm going to take WCF test client. Yeah, yeah. I was, really sure. I was working this morning and last night when I was testing it. So no, I the hell it's not uh, the Sorry? So I did the hell it's not the earth. Yeah. <laughs> you can always trust the demo gods to like play perfectly when you actually have to do a demo. Yeah. Yeah. Tell the bar is still halfway. I don't even get it. Exactly. Uh, why, why did you go Did you help me out? Yes. Yes. So the container for Docker is a, you know, I like to think of it like a VM instance. What is the image inside the image that I see? Because when you go Docker images, you bring up a whole lot of images. What are the actual images? Are they the running instance of that the ex executable into them, the program app itself? Or, you know, what is the, what is the image actually that's in there? Okay. Yeah, what is the image? Okay, so there's, Oh, that's awesome. I'll sort that out now. So, to answer your question, um, think of Docker not or a container as not a, a, a VM. Yeah. It's more of, an, in my mind, it's, it's a nice way of saying it is, you got Chrome, and then you got tabs, yeah. right? Each tab is executing the exe, the Chrome exe, yeah. but it's executing with a, a separate file, a, a sandbox file system that has configurations for their for their tab to function. Okay. So when you when you load a website, that that data that gets saved in the browser in, in that session is saved in that space. When you close it and you clear out your cache, then it deletes that folder. Containers are very similar in the way that they operate. They are that when they spin up, they are talking to the kernel. Then inside your image, you are telling the kernel, I'm allowing you to have this basic information. And that information could be environment variables, it could be um, other EXEs, uh, which actually exist in a, again, a little folder that it, it has access to. Um, application settings, um, stuff that, that describe a state of what a, a machine should be, right? That's, that's what's inside a container. The image that she said was a Docker list images, uh, you are listing the configuration specifications for a list uh, for a, a set of applications. So, if we bring it down to Windows Server Call, um, if your image is Microsoft forward slash uh, Windows Server Call tag 10.2.6.8, you are and you're listing it. You are saying to the CLI, hey. Um, on this kernel, which is Windows Server 2016, I want this set of configuration items which evaluate to Windows Server Call with that tag number. Make sense? Yeah. So when you're actually executing it, so that's just an image, it's a configuration. It's not actually running a container at any given time. So I hear the, the, the concept, the, the terms being mentioned kind of loosely, like I want to push my container into a registry. Technically, you can't. You can only push the configuration of what a container would be running at a given time. A container is a running execution of a workload. An image is a specification what that container, the workload, needs to run. So that's why there's a Docker file. It, it's, where, this, it's almost like a promise. I want this to run here, kind of thing. With me. So, so, so you could say that for each 
application you run in a certain Docker container in this application? Yes. Okay. Best practice, put one application in one container. You can run multiple containers the same way you can run multiple applications in, in a VM. And you can run multiple VMs on, on a data center. The whole uh, compounding effect. Yeah. You can run two, two programs. You can, nothing stops you from running an API, a database, and a, a, a website inside one container. It is not best practice because you're, you're effectively doing the same workload as you would on a VM. Rather put on VM then. Yeah. Rather have three containers, one web, one API, one database, and then now you can scale them out at will. You know, they're freestanding components. Okay. Uh, the, the premise of microservices always stands in, a, in this kind of conversation where put multiple, put workloads where they belong kind of thing. Okay. So you might want to load balance your front end for some bizarre reason, make 50 copies of that website, 50 containers, have a load balancer like your Kubernetes or something yeah. that will take that request and shunt it to the right place. Right. That's why you do that kind of thing. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Let's see what this area is. Oh, okay. I might have the wrong IP address. So, in Windows containers, um, the concept of uh, addressing something as local hosts uh, until they fix it is not actually feasible. So when you're running your container, you actually get an IP address. It's a local IP address uh, based on the Docker NAT if you don't specify it, and therefore um, you can actually interrogate the container to get the, the IP address. I'm suspecting that's what's happening. So I'm going to talk to the container Uh, so I'm going to say docker inspect dash dash format. So if you say docker inspect with a container name or ID, uh, you'll get a whole JSON of the basic configuration for the container. Um, so certain settings like environment variables, cyber true, but connection strings, if you specify it without secrets, you'll see it there as well. Um, so I'm, just, I'm going to rip out the IP address of the my service to you. Sorry, the additional. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Copy paste error. Wants to be <laughs> <laughs> it's 
three testing these. Uh, mm. You always wonder if you could have like a progress software as well. So yeah. Some idea of what's happening. I totally agree with you, it's so nice. This is running. This is running. Let's take it for IP address. They contain the name of service two. The actual endpoint should be service one. Go here. Yeah, I service one contract. Huh. Let's assume that worked. <laughs> uh, I'll just kind of hand you off that one. Okay. So the last part of the demonstration was to um, actually put a database into this as well. I'll, I'll show you what the service would have looked like, Compose would look like if I added it in. And but I'll first put the, the database in. So this was my whole Compose file. So um, there was a WCF service that I had. Oh, I understand now it's configuration. I'll change it just now. Um, so there's a WCF that I was trying to connect to. It depends on the database. And the database portion is here. And you set the configuration. So I'm going to actually put this database into the Visual Studio Compose just now. And we can actually create a database at will. And we can hydrate it if you want to with a, a SQL script or how you want to do it and then you can actually have your database working with your Visual Studio project. And if, the, if I can get the WCF to work again, then you'll actually, what will happen is the database will warm up, and then the WCF, WCF will warm up, and then I can debug against it. Yeah. So in Visual Studio, um, just that you can see how this works, is if I create a new project, and um, We've actually added now into the tooling that asks you by default if I create a new project, new project, and I say web, uh, let's say Dominic Core as an example, and I've created this application, it asks you do you want enable Docker support? And you can specify the operating system at that point. Which is quite useful. Uh, so if you know that your workload is going to be in Windows, which a lot of the legacy stuff is, you can specify it here. If you forget to do it here, you can do it later. You can add Docker support and it'll ask you a very similar question. Um, and you can change, once you've got your, your, I'll actually show you the project. Once you've got the project, you can actually flip between Windows and Linux as well. And there's two, uh, apart from the tooling, is it also hinges off the, the Docker file, the base image that you specify inside the Docker file, um, because that tells it which uh, operating system you're going to be leveraging with. So, 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 do you know your Docker file from? Sorry? Your Docker file is from a .NET account, so, I don't know, a Microsoft. Yes. You wouldn't be able to run it on the Unix uh, Docker image that you have there. So. Because it has to run on the Windows. Okay, so uh, if I understand you correctly, is um, the image that they're going to this is going to create a Docker file, and that Docker file has a Docker uh, a from yeah. base image. Yeah. Um, if if you select Windows here, it's going to use a base image that is targeting Windows Server Core as its kernel, right? Mm -hmm. You can swap that if you if your code base is .NET Core, then you can swap swap that out to be. Um, a kernel that leverages off Ubuntu uh, or Unix 
platform which currently Microsoft support Ubuntu, and you can target the Ubuntu kernel, and therefore you can run it on a Linux. But like one, Yes, yes, unfortunately. And so they've ported all the WCO uh, methods over to Dynamic Core. If you have your Docker file already set up with all your services, your database, and all your ports, like how you just showed, yeah. how easy it is to switch to Linux? For the whole thing. For the entire thing. For the whole solution. Um, it would depend on what target framework you've got for that whole solution. The alternative is the parts that can go to Linux. Uh, you would create a separate solution that can go to Linux and keep the legacy stuff on the Windows stuff. Because at the end of the day, when you're running, uh, when you're running containers, the main com communication uh, method is through the network. So if your Linux uh, network can talk to your Windows network, then nothing's, and you're going through a, uh, a protocol like TCP or, or HTTP or something like that, uh, what you're doing is you're opening up ports. And if, as long as both ends can talk on those ports, they can, they can communicate. So you could run it that way. Um, there's a couple of projects that our team is helping on to try actually implement that because we have some systems that um, are, are legacy based uh, that, you, that you need to run, specifically da databases and older systems where they, they need to live on the environment, the VMs that they're running on kind of thing. But as long as the, that network can, can talk to the container world, then the newer systems or the, the migrating systems can go to that. But to port the whole thing as is, um, I don't think, depending on the code base, I don't think everything will be able to just flip over. Okay. Cool. Um, so cool. So I'm going to say, okay. And what this is going to do is going to create a project. Everything's 100%. But it's going to create a specific project in the solution. And that is targeting Microsoft's SDK that uses Docker CLI in the back end. Right? And what that allows them to do is they've created some partial scripts that uh, interrogates your, your, your RAM containers and stuff like that. And when you debug it, it rips down and rebuilds up containers at will with your code base. That way you can debug. And they leverage that by using a remote debugger. So I'll show you. Now what you will find is, depending on how automated your build systems are, you might want to, because your build system might not have this SDK built or installed on your build agent. So, inside the oh, goodness, sorry. There it is. This is a Docker Compose, the little ship. What this is, is it's a, a project type. So it has, similar to the way your, your CS proj works. I think it's a DCS proj, and I'm just doing the file extension. And it has compose files and it has transformation for the compose files. So you'll see, similarly, with the way you see your web configs, you see your compose. Now, Docker Compose is an orchestration uh, feature that Docker CLI comes with. So if you have a website and a database, but you want to interact with them together, you use a compose to upstand these services together. Docker file is there to create an image, and uh, the Docker run command is to run your container against an image, and the compose does a run as if you ran it for multiple containers at the same time, but in one step. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that just now. So because of this compose, they allow an override system. So if you just do your They have a parameter that you can see. Oh, this is horrible. Let's do it this way. They have a parameter that they that allow you to set, which is the Docker registry. And then they append your project name to the end of this image. So they, they're helping you out here. And then they've created a file called Docker file. And you'll notice that says the command is bold, the context is here, which is the dots, and then they're pointing to the Docker file, which is in the folder called Web Application One, and then the root is the Docker file. So let's go and look at that file, which is over here. Sorry. So what you'll notice is, first of all, this is a very long file. 
so this is used a concept called multi-stage build, and I'll explain it now. And um, also, what you'll notice is it's intended for a, a Docker file to live in the root of the application that you're building. So you can have in your solution, tell you've got four products, uh, four endpoints, or WCF, a web API, and a website. And they all live inside your solution. You have three Docker files. And then you could have a compose that talks to those Docker files. And that's effectively what's happening here. So on a, on a multi-stage file, it's saying, okay, I'm going to start off with Windows Server Core, Nano Server as base. So that they, they're aliasing it by, the, by using the word as base. And it's going to create a, a folder called app, and it's going to expose port 80. Next step. So that's effectively create a container, did something, and the output is now available to the next step. Then they say, okay, now we need Windows Server Core, build, nano, that specific tag as build. We're going to create another folder called working directory. Remember, we still have a folder called app. Copy the CS project into the current location and do a .NET restore. When it's done, copy the rest of the code. That's a very sp a specific step there. Does anyone know why I'd want to do a restore before I do a copy and build? Just out of curiosity. New get packaging. Exactly. So what's happening is each layer, each command that happens in Docker, happens inside a container, which happens in a layer. Those layers are naturally cached. So if I do my media package restore prior to my build, I've effectively cached and available for the next build those media packages. The next time it runs, it's faster. Okay. So now we we have our copy build, awesome, and then we're going to run the .NET CS project release. So there we actually creating the release package. All right. Now now comes the next step. Build as publish, that's going to do another publish there. And the final step, we're going to take the final outputs and put it into the, the app and execute it. So that's the entry point. So the last step is the entry point. You don't have to exit your, your image with an entry point. In this case, we want to.